Sunday food is today's podcast. My name is Jodie Bunting and today's special guest is my lovely friend, Lucy Price, who is a hotel management extraordinaire, aren't you, Lucy? Well, you know, one does not want to toot their own horn, but okay. <laughs> now, I first... That. I first met Lucy when I was working in Sharm. She was the food and beverage manager at a hotel there. Uh, she's now living in Torquay. But as you might be able to tell from her accent when she starts talking, you're actually from Coventry, near here. Yes, I am. I am from my sins. You will never get rid of that twang and I'm very proud of it. Thank you. When I was in Egypt, I was so happy to hear it though, really, Lucy. You make me just feel like a home comfort, like a walking, talking home comfort you were. I kept you grounded. I kept you grounded is what I did, Joe. <laughs> now, before we start, I should apologise, Lucy, because I feel like I brought you lots of stress as well in that hotel when you were kind. You were an indirect manager for me, weren't you? Um, I will not comment on that. I'll plead the fifth. I think it was OK. I took great care of you, though, didn't I? You did. So just to explain the logistics, Lucy was working as hotel um, food and beverage manager. I had an animation company uh, and unfortunately for Lucy, the animation kind of came under her umbrella and she had to watch the most horrific shows that me and my team put on. Remember the Mamma Mia dance? I thought they were fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I have to say, some of the people that, that occasionally worked there were rather questionable, <laughs> but um, I, I thought the shows were great. You, you worked with what you'd got, that's what we'll say. Well, that is true, because, you know, this was the problem, I think, that you found as well. It's actually, when you are in the middle of desert, the desert, you haven't got much choice on staffing, have you? You kind of had to work with what you'd got. Yeah, absolutely. But it made the holiday, certainly for the Brits, they thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we were yes, really it, lucky. It was, um, it was like African Phoenix Nights, I think, on occasions. <laughs> <laughs> we were lucky because we had quite a lot of Brits in our hotel and they were all, a lot of them were repeat guests as well, weren't they? Yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them. They, they did enjoy themselves when they came over. So even if they weren't happy with any aspect of the, the hotel or entertainment or food or anything, I think we could win them over with the fact that we did know them and we were fellow Brits, so yeah. it wasn't such a problem. It was just everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should mention the hotel as well. For the, anybody who do, hasn't been to Egypt, me and Lucy worked at this great one be called the Reef Oasis Hotel. It had one of the best beaches in the whole of Sharm, the whole of Egypt, didn't it? It really did, yeah. So it's Reef Oasis Beach and it's a Sentido now as well. I don't know whether it still is, but it used to be a Sentido. And um, <clears throat> I say when we worked there, it was even when the shark attacks were going ahead. Yes, and that was it really was. Long reef, so it killed. We had a great diving space as well. So we had a fabulous coral reef and it just, it just, pardon the pun, killed all of that, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> And what about the aqua park as well? Remember that amazing aqua park? It was recently built, wasn't it, when we were there? Yeah, so the aqua park, we were very lucky because we did have the aqua park there and it just had the two slides, but I know now there's a lot more. Um, they've spent right. a lot more money on it and it's actually got a huge kids area and more slides. So they, they have invested a whole lot of money on that. But uh, it was great at the time there as well. Children loved it as well as the yeah. adults, I think. So tell us a little bit about your story, because I actually don't know this. How did you yourself get into the hotel industry? Oh, wow. So, uh, well, I'll do a long story short. So I've been in hospitality and been in pubs since I was about 18, started in bars. And I used to work for M&B and there used to be a brand, I don't know whether you remember it, in the UK called Sawyer's. Do you remember no. Sawyer's Bars? It, no. was, it was national. It was, you know, it was, it was the thing at the time. Anyway, they sold our our brand. I moved to Blackpool. I worked in Blackpool for seven years in pubs and bars. Managed to get myself on the front of the Blackpool Gazette for being the first female licensee of the Golden Mile. Um, so after seven years that I moved down to South London, I could tell, I could fill in a whole podcast about London. Yeah. That was horrific. I used to have fights in there. There was uh, an armed robbery. Um, a gypsy wedding fight. Uh, my friend's car got petrol bombed, and wow. my 
assistant manager had threats because she barred a, an undesirable and we used to have gates on our front um, driveway because people used to congregate after we closed so we shut the gates she barred this undesirable and then the next morning after the, the opening up procedure was to open the gates and she went to the gates outside and she found a pig's head with her mobile phone number pinned to this pig's ear dead pig obviously no. so i decided i wanted to leave <laughs> shockingly yeah, so I decided I wanted to leave, so I was applying for anything hospitality-wise, and one of the jobs I applied for was in Dubai. It was a pre-opening hotel, um, and they were looking for a manager to go out there and run their English pub that was opening within this hotel. And as it happens, it's right opposite now to Burj Khalifa. But when I first moved over to Dubai, Burj Khalifa was a camel farm, oh. and I watched it. I watched it get built two floors a week, Burj Khalifa, I watched it get built. Anyway, I, I ran that for a while. I moved to another hotel, a finer hotel down on Jumeirah Beach, right on the seafront. Um, and then I got headhunted by the general manager who was at Reef Oasis at the time to go across to Egypt and take over the food and beverage area, which is what I did. And right. I was there for two years and stayed there for two years. How did um, they find you, by the way? Who knows? LinkedIn Who knows? or just word no, I'm, of mouth? I mean, my CV had always been on Caterer Global. I'd never taken it off. I wasn't actively looking for work, but it was always just sitting there. And I presume it was from there because I hadn't applied for any jobs. I certainly hadn't looked at, at Egypt as a role. And I did just get a telephone call out of the blue and I spoke to him and I flew over for the interview and I really liked the resort and I liked the opportunity and thought, let's do it. Let's try. You know, the prices in Dubai were going up and up and it, it used to be tax free. It isn't now. So it wasn't the place it was and you couldn't save all your money. You ended yeah. up spending everything that you earned because there was just too much to do. Yeah. So I thought I'll go and work in the middle of the desert where you physically cannot spend any money. Um, so I went over to Egypt and did that. And funnily enough, just before I found out that I was pregnant with my son now, Ollie, that's 10, um, I just had a phone call and I was offered a job to go and work as a GM in the Maldives. Oh. Oh, which I had to decline. Um, so I moved back to the UK and I, I ran hotels for three or four years down in Torquay. I took a couple of years out when I had Ollie so I could see all the nice bits. The first, the first tooth come in, the first steps. Yeah. Then I moved down to Torquay and when it was things like potty training that I wasn't overly interested in. I went back to work and had a nanny looking after Ollie while I did my hotels again. And then when he got to school age, I decided that I'd had enough of the late nights and the weekends and the bank holidays. So I am now working a normal person's job, Monday to Friday, nine to five, and it's just heavenly. Hallelujah for that. That's a, is, You know, after being in any sort of leisure industry, working evenings and weekends, it's just joyful, isn't it? Absolutely. Do you know, I still I still miss the itch and I'd quite happily, if any of my friends needed help in a bar, I'd love to jump behind a bar and pull a few pints and, you know, interact with customers. But I can honestly say, hand on heart, I do not miss the grief and the headache and the, the stress that is surrounded by the thankless tasks that is hospitality. And I absolutely tip my hat to anybody that's still within hospitality and I really do I really do feel their pain, certainly in, in these times as it is, and yeah. you know, the be kind and that, and I, I really do feel for them, but I'm not going back. <laughs> Good. Oh, <no. laughs> so tell us about this hotel uh, down south, that it was a bit of a famous hotel, it appeared on Channel 4. It did, so when I when I moved back, I moved to the Midlands and I was near to my mum and dad when I when I had my son and I thought I'd start looking for jobs and I, I looked for any general manager roles. So there was one, you probably know, Horcross Hall. Oh, I went, I, right near I, me. I got an interview for Horcross Hall and I turned it down because I didn't like the man that interviewed me because yeah. I was there for an hour and I think about 55 minutes he talked about himself and I thought, I can't no. cope. So gave that one up. Then I got offered a job in Gibraltar working on um, a ship. It was a similar like QE2 or it was one of the big ships that was in the docks there that they turned into a five star hotel. And then I got a phone call from a guy that had just bought a hotel down in Torquay 
that was on the Channel 4 show called The Hotel. And it was following the ups and downs of the rather wacky manager at the time and owner, Mark Jenkins. And he was very farcical. He was like a, a Mr. Bean of the hotel world, if you like. Um, he, he did, he ran the hotel to the ground. You couldn't help but love him. Um, but yeah, he ran out of money and he, he didn't do great things with the hotel. He was very famous on the Channel 4 show for doing the dolphin racing on the in the pool. He got the inflatable dolphins and does that ring any bells to you? It is now, now you've said that, yeah. I actually think I remember. Yeah, as soon as you see him, you'll remember him straight away. But he sold his hotel, he sold up um, to a Southwest businessman um, who had a, a sort of a small group of hotels down here. And I went to run those for a couple of years, which was uh, eye opening. So, so that's, that's, that's you must have the... seen that as a challenge then, did you, if you'd seen it on TV? Oh, absolutely. It was, you know, I did watch that that TV programme. I thought it was hilarious. And the fact that when I got this phone call and the, the interview started with, you do know which hotel this is, don't you? Did you ever see the hotel? <laughs> went, oh my God, yeah, I did. So, you know, at least I can't, you know, get any further down. So challenge accepted kind of thing. And we used to get people even on, because Torquay gets a lot of, sort of coaching holidays here. Yeah. And past the pause on the coaches, they would stop outside the hotel and get out and get their picture taken behind the grove sign wow. just because it's been on the tv so as much as the current owner wanted to get away from that it was doing quite well just getting people in for a cup of tea or a scone or a devon cream tea in the afternoon just to say that they'd been at the famous grosvenor so yeah challenging we've had we've had a few challenges there we did try to change the the whole persona of the hotel by trying different, you know, weekends and, and stays, but it, it didn't work. Oh, well, well done for trying, Luce. Yeah. Now, we're going to talk about holiday food. So okay. just how long were you working in Dubai and how long were you working in Egypt in total? Right, so Dubai, I was in there for seven years and Egypt was just two years, although it felt like a lot longer at times. And um, what are the main differences, do you think, on like foreign food abroad, like foreign, especially all inclusives, like we were in Sharm, yeah. versus like UK holiday? Do you think there is a big difference? Oh, I mean, there's a massive difference. So we can take Dubai out of that because Dubai, they don't do all inclusive. There's lots of seafood there and it's very opulent and very expensive. You know, if you go to a brunch in Dubai, it's standard to have huge prawns and and oysters on the all-you-can-eat buffet. So that's, wow. you know, completely different. Egypt, obviously, most of the hotels there, certainly in Sharm or in Haggard, they were always all-inclusive. So they always had to try and cater for quite a large variety of European people. Yeah. Um, so the, the majority of people that we had at Reef Oasis, we either had Germans, Italians, Russians, and English. And we had to have three restaurants that catered for everybody. So I think as standard in Sharm, there was always an Italian restaurant because the Italians will only eat Italian food. It doesn't matter where in the world you put an Italian person, but if they don't have pasta, they're not going. Um, so it was just a standard that you had to have it, an Italian restaurant or at least Italian food. And would Russian... you say that? Would you say that about the Brits? They wouldn't eat if there's not chips. <laughs> there's two different sorts of Brits. You've got the Brits that they expect wherever they go to have some sort of beige food, yeah. which you always had to have. And then you've got the Brits that think they're being really adventurous by trying something different, which might be a kebab, <laughs> it might be a little bit of pasta, it might be something that perhaps you wouldn't get as the norm from Deliveroo, from your local high street stores or takeaways. Um, so we had both. We had both at Reef, Reef Oasis, but absolutely, we always had to cater for the Beige Food Brigade. Otherwise, it would just cause complaints. My favourite thing was when the guests used to see the full beans. For anybody who don't know what full beans is, it's basically oh. brown beans that have been kind of boiled and it just looks like but sick, doesn't it? Yeah, it wasn't the greatest. I mean, Egyptian food, some of it can be very healthy, but some of it does look a little bit sort of sloppy. Yeah. 
Okay, and if you don't know what it is, no, you wouldn't you wouldn't go near it, I don't think. But I'm happy that falafel has kind of taken off in the UK now, because that was my favourite memory of e Egyptian food. Yeah. I mean, the salads were great. The Egyptian salads were always great, and the dips um, and all of that that they did. But, yeah, some of the, the breakfasts, I mean, you always get the full for breakfast, didn't you, with the breads yeah. and the, the tomato and... You know, it's the last thing that you really want. It's like eating a, a kebab in the morning, isn't it? Because it was so heavily spiced. It's just, you know, unless you're still drunk from the night before, you do not touch the Egyptian fool, do you? <laughs> do you know the one product in the supermarket, in all supermarkets, that's always from Egypt? Do you know it in the produce aisle? One. Spring onions. And I have to oh. stop myself buying them when I see the word Egypt because it just makes me so angry flashback <laughs> but yeah that just goes to show they are quite good at growing strawberries and stuff like that obviously because of the heat um, yeah. and that was probably the best thing about the buffets like you said just the freshness of all the stuff that you wouldn't generally get all year round in the UK yeah so I when I talk to my slimmers about holiday food because of my experience in maybe lower class hotels than reef oasis was i work for the albatross group and that's where i really got into the nitty gritty of the food and beverage department um and although they had like fresh cooking stations it was always like pizza pasta pancakes and just cheap food basically it wasn't yeah. your high standard lucy but <laughs> i <laughs> I always say to my slimmers, it was all kind of a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of fat to make it taste amazing for holidays. Do you think that is generally what these kitchens do to make the stuff taste good? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure that that's part of it. But from from my experience when we were there and we were serving, I mean, the, the resort where we were, it held about 2,000 people, but you'd never know it. And I don't think that we really did sort of lower our standards on the quality of the food. I mean, out there now, even in Egypt, which, you know, it, it's probably not as advanced in the food and the, and the industries that we've got over here in the UK, they were pretty strict on food hygiene and standards. Yeah. Um, so the, the live cooking that we had there, we used to get the omelettes and we used to have, like you said, the, the pancakes and the pastas, but they were all pretty decent sort of quality so I, I don't think it was too much of a problem over there you know we, we didn't kill anybody with the food and everybody seemed quite happy with it and it was you know it's part of the show isn't it watching yeah. them cook it so yeah it was a it was a good thing over there well let's just say when I moved to a hotel that didn't have a British food and beverage manager I noticed uh I mean <laughs> we we were really lucky when we were at Reef Oasis we had um sort of a proper Indian chef that used to go around with a portable um, tandoori oven and he used to do all the freshly cooked naan breads and put the skewers of the tandoori chicken and lamb, um, yeah, the lamb, the minted lamb skewers yeah. in there and you could watch him making those and watching the naan breads was fabulous. And we had a sushi chef as well, didn't we? He was great. Wait, I can't remember that. Yeah, sushi and sashimi. Oof, oh. He was good at so it's not always bad, you know, you used to get really yeah. good quality as well. Kind of one of the in-jokes when we worked in Egypt, especially with me and you together, was kind of the uh, the nationality of our guests, shall we say. What do you think, what did you think you noticed as a food and beverage manager when it came to dining of the different nationalities? Well, dining, we, we actually used to do this, and I know we did this, didn't we, Joe? Before they'd even opened their mouths, before they'd said anything, before putting their names, it was a guess the nationality of the guests. And it was it was very easy, I think, certainly when you'd been there for a while, you could always tell the nationalities purely by the way they helped themselves to the food, sat at the table and set the food out. For example, British people, very classy. We'd go up, we'd choose our starters, we'd get our bread and butter, sit down, eat it. Once we'd finished, we'd wait for the, the plates to be cleared and then move for the next course and get a little bit of everything, maybe go up two or three times, but we'd do it the way we do in the UK. Italian people, 
they would only be in the Italian restaurants. So you'd never see them in any of the other restaurants. So they were pretty easy to, to tell who they were anyway with their piles of pasta that they'd eat in their Italian way. Russian people, you could tell, because Russians did not like wasting energy. They would have a little peruse of the buffet and then they would get starter main and dessert on multiple plates, large amounts of, and put them just all over the table. They'd have their main plate full of food, starter main dessert, and then they'd have extra in the middle of the table, possibly a bit of melon. They were partial to a bit of melon at the end of Water the meal. Watermelon, they were crazy for it. <laughs> but it was just full. The table would be full and there may be only two or three people there. There was enough to feed, you know, a small family and it would be full. And nine times out of 10, they wouldn't eat it all. And they yeah. used to leave loads of food but it was just a case of once they sat down they did not want to be bothered with being interrupted halfway through this feast it all had to be on the table so you could absolutely tell the nationalities just by the way they they worked the buffet and i think it's something to do with the uh, i think when they eat at home they're used to having like all this food on the table and just having a buffet but i don't understand why they felt like they needed to recreate that when the buffet is no. there do you think you know, they were scared of it all going or quite possibly were they through did they go through famines i don't know but you know british we like a good roast i mean ollie loves yeah. a roast serve, you, serve yourself dinner you know when i'll put the potatoes and the vegetables in the middle of the the table and you can serve yourself he likes it just because he makes sure he doesn't get too many of the carrots. I know his game. But you know, serve yourself, he's all very good, but he will not pile everything on the plate yeah. knowing full well that you're not going to eat it. And I think that's, you know, we have carveries here and we, you know, we'll do the buffets and we do tend to, you do see people piling it on, but they're hungry and they eat it and they will not get multiple plates and just put it across the table. And, you know, it's it's not discriminated. That is what the Russians do. And that's yeah. what they always do. They fill the table. When I worked in my next hotel, I worked with a lot of Eastern Europeans who were working in guest relations. And when I asked them, especially about the fruit thing, they said that it was to do with the availability. Because apparently, even if you have all the money in the world, you just can't buy these nice fruits in, in Russia and Eastern Europe. And then secondly, they're saying when they do have them there, they're so expensive. This they like my new hotel, the Albatross one. There was a riot when they bought out the watermelons, Lucy. You wouldn't believe yeah. it. They well, just it, like jumped they, on. Yeah, watermelon and the mango. They used to go for it. But saying that, when I was in Dubai, if I went to the buffets, I did exactly the same with the prawns and the oysters yeah. because it's you know you pay through the nose to get them here but they are just everywhere in in dubai and so easily available because they're gulf um prawns and gulf lobsters so they're just all over the place but i used to you know pile them on my plate i still do now when i go to the all you can eat chinese and oh, I've got prawns on with ginger let's get loads of them in case we don't get any ever again <laughs> so I, I i do get it but yeah they were very easy to distinguish from the other nationalities now tell us about these guests now unfortunately i missed out on these guests you were telling me about them a bit of a dominatrix weren't they oh yes i mean we had some fabulous sights while we were in the hotel and, and two that stand out for me and i did have one of my friends visiting at the time i think it was my crazy friend steph but we were in our italian restaurant for the one evening and all of a sudden a gentleman walks in with a lady behind him that's dressed in black shiny rubber slash latex slash leather with a dog collar on and she was very I mean very attractive didn't speak and she just sort of stood very solemnly behind the man um, so he'd walk along and he'd look along the buffet and choose what he wanted to eat and every so often he'd go and the, the lady would serve it up and he'd nod and say okay and they'd go along the buffet and She'd serve some more, and then once he'd finished, he'd walk to the table, and he'd sit down. And once he'd sat down, he'd sort of do the nod, and she'd put the plate in front of him, and she just sort of stood, stood like a statue, and he, you know, he'd be eating. A good ten minutes, he was eating, and you could see the whole of the restaurant were watching this couple because it was just fascinating. And I'm guessing they were loving everyone watching them, were they? Well, I think so, but all of a sudden he did the nod and then she was allowed to sit down and, and eat. I mean, it didn't 
take a genius to realise what kind of holiday they were on. But we did see them later on in one of the hotel lobbies and she was on his lap and, I mean, they were all over each other. Nothing explicit, but you could yeah. see that they were going to have a really great evening later. <laughs> So yeah. it sounds like this experience prepared you well for the nature naturist weekend at your Torquay hotel then. Oh, yes, that was also an experience. And this was in the hotel, the, the Grosvenor. And uh, one of the ideas to try and boom business was to agree to this um, British naturist weekend, which was fabulous. Um, lots of things that we had to do to prepare for this. One of them being our maintenance guys spent the whole day before they arrived we had big bay windows and they had to go around with brown paper, you know, wrapping paper or parcel paper and just covering all of the windows. So everything was blacked out. So it was as dark as night in the hotel without the lights on. And um, yeah, the hotel was taken over for the whole weekend with British naturists. Fabulous. So it got to, I think they, they all arrived on the Friday and strip off time was six. So, you know, they'd all gather in the in the uh, sort of like the lounge area and they do their welcome thank you for coming hope we have a great weekend okay strip so everybody just you know they're all standing there in towels and all of a sudden the towels went um so obviously we had to speak to the staff before it started to make sure that they were happy with this because you, yeah. you know you don't you don't want to offend anybody and i was like oh, i'm up for this let's see what's going on and uh, it, it was really weird at the beginning when you've got people coming to the reception and talking to you about, you know, problem with a room key or want, you know, an extra plug in their room. And you honestly, and it's true what they say, you honestly do not know where to look. You know you should be looking at their face, but you, 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 you just can't help it. And you are upping and downing. But after the first two or three hours, no problem whatsoever. It was just... It was just normal completely normal although I did find some of their activities questionable um, there was a naked piano recital which I thought was a bit odd and yeah. I never want to see naked Jenga again oh ever. no <laughs> but yeah they had a great time I mean they had all their rules and it was all very hygienic we had a lot of it was disclosed to the local press that we were having this weekend so we did get a lot of phone calls from prudish people saying that they were never coming to the hotel again and they do not want to sit on a chair that's had a naked bottom on it. And I mean, really ridiculous remarks. And they, you know, it was a great weekend. There was no trouble. I mean, it was a captive audience. You can't really go out and, you know, have a drink anywhere else unless you put yeah. your clothes on. The whole point of the weekend, you know, they always sat on towels, they were very respectful. And, it, you know, they must have thought from the outside that it was some sort of weird, dodgy swingers weekend when it absolutely wasn't. It was just people <laughs> that liked to just be free, should we say. Great weekend. These people don't realise a naked bottom on a hotel chair is nothing compared to what actually goes on on hotel chairs, is it? I know, there's probably been worse. I mean, swimming pools, but anyway. <laughs> Right, we can't talk about the hotel industry without talking about TripAdvisor these days. It seems to be more and more important. What do you think? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I mean, I use it. If I'm going away, I will look at TripAdvisor, but I will, you know, I think I'm old enough and wise enough to know if somebody's writing something just because they didn't get their own way. So I think you do need to be careful with, you know, taking some of these reviews with a pinch of salt. Yeah. You're never going to please everybody and you can tell that some people are writing it just because they're trying to get something for nothing and they haven't and they've just got a bit of an axe to grind. Yeah. Um, but I, I honestly, I think it's a really handy tool and I do, if I'm booking somewhere and I haven't been to that location before, whether it's in the UK or whether it's abroad, I will, that is my go-to place to look at TripAdvisor. But I also find it quite entertaining with some of these certainly privately owned restaurants hotels bars some of the responses from the owners yeah i think some of them are hilarious you can tell when someone's taken particular offense to a review which entertains me no end but I, I do think it's a handy tool but i think that people should be sensible with it and not take it as the gospel yeah uh, but if they do see some negative reviews and to take them more or less with a pinch of salt unless it's consistently poor yeah. And then, you know, there's a, a few red flags. But I think if you're sensible with it, it's a really good tool as to decide 
what you should do based on what your budget is and what you're looking for. You know, what you want might not be what, you know, Joe Bloggs has reviewed it on. Because 13 years ago when we were at that hotel in Egypt, me and you used to get quite a big shout out because guests were just shocked to see us, weren't they? We did. I think it was it was novel out there purely because in Sharm and all of the teams in all of the hotels, they were either Eastern European or they were Egyptian. So yeah. we, we had that novelty factor, if you like. And I think that the, the Egyptian owners that we worked for, they were quite savvy to get a Brit on board especially because they tended to pay a little bit more than some of the other countries and they came in the the months when perhaps it wasn't busy with other nationalities because of the weather over here. Um, so having a Brit over there, if there was any problems, it was, oh, send them to Joe, send them to Lucy, yeah. we won't deal with it. Because British people, as much as we, we don't like to say it, we are a bit of a handful and I think a Brit can handle a Brit much better than if an Egyptian handles a Brit. Um, they'll, they'll tend to listen a little bit more and we know not to accept some of the things that the British come out with. Because, I mean, they come out with some real right old stories and you go, what? What are you talking about? Get a grip. Whereas the Egyptians are very sort of subservient and they will apologise and yeah. see if they something. And they do push the look a little bit. Whereas we can go, no, <laughs> absolutely not. And this is where kind of our roles reversed, wasn't it? Where we tried to be the friend of the Brits and stuff like that. Sometimes when you saw the Brits treat the Egyptians like they did, we had to step in just to defend the Egyptians, didn't we? Absolutely. And nine times out of ten when we did that, they will completely back off. And all of a sudden, yeah. the lovely Egyptian staff are getting a really good tip at the end of the holiday. <laughs> so, you know, it was a win-win situation, really, wasn't it? <laughs> Now, we also, we can't talk about Egypt. I had a stalker incident. I had a complaint, get this, Lucy, before the guests had even arrived into Egypt. That's how good you are, Joe. You get stalkers before they come. But tell us about your stalker experience. Oh, my goodness. I had a stalker as well. And, like, you know, you read about it in the in the, the press and you think, oh, my God, these people, you know, what's, what's the problem with getting a, you know, a person that follows you? But... I was living on the resort in Reef Oasis and all of a sudden my phone was just red hot with calls and it's not just one or two or three calls and it was hundreds of calls and it was text messages calling me some pretty horrible things and saying some pretty nasty things in in poor English and also in Arabic and um, you know I, I did switch my phone off at night or I did silence it so it wasn't waking me up but it was it was throughout the day as well and I'd find myself waking up in the middle of the night just to look at my phone. I don't know why I did it. It was just in case nothing had happened and it was all over and you'd look at your phone and all of a sudden it'd ping, 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 hundreds of messages. Um, no idea what it was. I didn't really go out, didn't do anything, didn't know anybody, had no clue what was going on, but they knew my name, they knew who I was. Um, so all of the, the resorts in Egypt, ever since the bombings back in the, was it the 80s or the 90s, it's a requirement that they have to have um, a security team and they have to vet sort of who goes in and out of the resort. So I took this problem to the security manager at the time and showed them all the problems and told him what was going on. Um, he was an ex-army and he got quite good contacts in, in Sharm. And he, for those that haven't been to Egypt, anybody that needs a mobile phone or wants to get a SIM card in Egypt, you have to show a copy of her ID, whether it's a passport or a driver's license, before they give you a SIM. It's not like here where you can buy, you know, hundreds of them and, and do with them as you will. You had to prove your identity before you got the card. Um, so this went to somebody else, it went to somebody else, and they, they eventually got the number or traced the number that, that was calling me. And it actually turned out to be one of the Egyptian bellboys that was working on the resort that every day in my little golf cart when I was driving around, wave at me or nod at me and never spoke to me. Got It got quite poor English and it was him. Wow. And when it was found out, it was reported to the GM and reported to the owner and they didn't sack him because he was a, a good bellboy and he'd been there for a number of years. They just transferred him up to Cairo instead. But it, it got that scary before they knew who it was. I've got security staying at the end of my block where I lived just in case yeah. any come up and you know it, it was it was pretty stressful and it went on for about four or five months and it wasn't a brilliant four or five months I have to say 
And do you think it was kind of, he was obsessed with you in a love-hate re- kind of way or what? I like to think it was just love, Joe, actually, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Because the, you know, the Egyptian guys, they are so nice and so loving, but, but they are also really jealous you know if somebody's getting all the attention and all the affection this is yeah. where these egyptian guys are worse than like pensioners aren't they worse than british pensioners yeah. the bingo well i actually did find out that this started um uh, because he might have taken a little bit of a shine to me and where i was living living in one of the hotel rooms next door to me was the executive chef german executive chef he liked to drink did this executive chef and once we'd finished work, because it was frowned upon to go out and go drinking in the in the resort, you know, occasionally I'd just pop next door and just have a can or two with him. And that was it. He, you know, he was a crazy, crazy eccentric German chef. And that was, there was nothing more and nothing less. And he used to pop and have a drink. And it seems that he did not approve of me going into this man's room when I wasn't married, he wasn't married, and it was behind closed doors. And that's what started it. Unbelievable all over a can of Heineken. <laughs> Who knew? Cheers to that, Lucy. Absolutely. So I've never drunk Heineken since. I've just gone to Harling now. Which is made in Burton-on-Trent, where I was born, my local here. So well done, Luce. Thank you. Pitching. <laughs> right. So what we want to do now, then, is to sum <laughs> up your top tips for enjoying holiday food in brackets, not getting food poisoning. Right, top tips. Number one, the live cooking stations are always a good shout. You yeah. know that they're fresh, they're cooked in front of you, so you've got no questions about how, where, why they were prepared because you've seen it all happen. So live cooking stations are always good. Um, if there is food that's been sitting outside for a while, make sure it's been covered, make sure it's been heated properly and it's not sitting there covered in flies. Um, And the main thing, I think all inclusives are all good and well, but don't overindulge on the first day or two. You know, everything in moderation. It's not all going to go. It's all going to be there for the duration of your holiday. There's always going to be refills. So I think, you know, all, all... you think that you're paying for everything that you're getting, but I think everything in moderation is the main thing, and then you'll have a great holiday. I, I don't think you've got to worry about the hygiene as much now, as long as I say you're sensible. If yeah. there's food that's sitting outside, but it's not warm, and it looks like it's been there a little bit longer than it should, possibly give it a swerve and go for something else. But yeah, you'll have a great time. Oh, loving your top tips. Personally, through your experience, where is your favourite summer destination or holiday destination generally? Uh, well, do you know, I'm, in my youth, I did an 18 to 30s now and again, but I can't really rate those because I don't remember properly all of them. But I have to say, living, living and working in Dubai, I think that is just a fabulous place. Um, I think it's always good to get some tips or to really research before you go there because everything can be quite expensive but there are some little gems to be found that you don't have to pay a lot of money for that are equally as good as these five star hotels the food will be just as fabulous and you'll be paying an absolute fraction but yet yeah, dubai is a must do for the service and the food you know i've never been you've just you literally not? talked me into my next holiday right there loose Fabulous. Honestly, I love Dubai. I really do. And the only reason I left it is because I was just spending more than I was earning. It, yeah. it just got, and uh, yeah, Expo 2022, as you know, came and it just put the prices of everything up. Rent, food, they put tax on it. So, you know, it, it's not as good money for people living over there anymore. But well, it depends what field you're in. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I've done my time, but I'd definitely go back again in a heartbeat for a holiday. Oh. Right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody, that was Lucy, the hotel food and beverage and just management supreme. Thank you.
please remember to like, give me a comment, share with your friends and of course subscribe to my channel. Thank you.